Well, thank you very much for, uh, Kristen, thank you very much for all you've, all you've done. We really appreciate it. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of the things you do are really not even known by a lot of folks. So thanks again. And to Catherine, uh, Catherine has been a rock star and all that she's done for all these years. And, and a lot of kids have been, been saved and prevented from being further abused because of her work. So uh, <clears throat> it's, our, it's our pleasure uh, walk a mile in their shoes to be here and share with you today some of the things that we've learned over the past year, uh, year and a half. Uh, Melanie Blair is going to speak following me. Melanie is, uh, I might as well introduce you now, Melanie. Melanie is a foster parent. She's an adoptive parent and she's a biological parent. Um, and she and her husband, Gary, uh, have really done a tremendous service for this state and all the caring and all the things they've done to, to help children who have and oftentimes no other place to go. The trouble is they, they foster children and fall in love with them, so then they adopt them. So it's, uh, that's, uh, that's really a, a gem for them. And Emily, Emily Small is a social worker and she's gonna speak after Mel. And Emily is, uh, has a wealth of experience from that social work standard. But maybe more than that, she has had a lot of experience with the Department of Health and Human Services, in particular, the Office of Child and Family Services. So we have a real good team uh, that really has, has done, I think, a lot of work that's maybe hopefully gonna have, have a good result uh, in the end. And Patrick Corey, he's our social media guide, sets our website up and all of that. And he, is, he has really been someone that um, we've relied on to get our information out there. So, Walk a Mile in their shoes. Uh, we're a nonprofit 501c3, and we really feel like um, we're all dedicated to this one cause, and that is to make sure that children, uh, they're dying at record numbers in the state of Maine, children in state care. Uh, Maine has the worst record of child abuse and child maltreatment. It's not something we're proud of. But it's, it's the worst record in the whole na nation. And in fact, there was a time when we were more than twice uh, the national rate of child abuse and child maltreatment. So that's something that <clears throat> we, we didn't know that fact coming into this, but it's just driven us that we've got to do more than what's been done now. The system that has been dealing with this, with these children over the years has been a system that is now, um, is obviously it's broken. It's broken to the point where it's gotten much worse than when I started working on this in 2001, when a little five-year-old girl, Logan Marr, uh, was killed by her caretaker, who was a caseworker and then a foster parent, which is a total no-no. Uh, that's just not something you do, but that was back in 2001 when it was the Department of Human Services under Governor King. When Logan was, was killed, and we, a lot of people started asking questions. A friend of mine, Billy Stokes, who's now a, a Superior Court Justice, he prosecuted that case. And what he said and what he learned was that the department was really in not well. I mean, I don't like to use the word corrupt, but it was really broken badly. And so from there, we learn that, wow, this is going on. Nobody really picked up on it. What's, what's, how bad is this? So then we find out it's really pretty bad. So Governor Baldacci came in, uh, and he absolutely, he, had, he knew about what had happened with the, with the broken system, tried to improve it, and he really did improve it. By the way, Governor Baldacci's on our board of directors uh, for our nonprofit. So we have a... We have a very, we have an all-star group on that, on that, uh, on our board. So Governor Baldacci made some proof. He actually got some national awards for what he did because he really did make a difference. The trouble is, the end of his term, the department had gotten so large, so cumbersome that it was starting to stumble again. And then Governor LePage came in and, and uh, he made some, he made some changes. Uh, I think at the beginning, the changes he made, he realized at the end of his eight years that that probably he had to correct what some of the things he had done, um, which, he, which he did. Uh, and then Governor Mills came in. So it's no, you have an independent governor, you have a Democratic governor, you have a Republican governor, you have another Democratic governor. So it's, this is zero partisan. There's nothing about this, these problems that are partisan. The, the, the kind of common thread is it seems to get, when it's bad, 
the more this, they circle, they pull the curtain, circle the wagon, so to speak, uh, in these various administrations, the worse it got. So we started with Logan Marr, then we had Ethan Henderson, a little, little two and a half month old boy who was his daycare reporters, the daycare people reported to the department that he and his twin brother had, had bruises all over them and that they were worried about him. The department didn't really check on him immediately. Finally, they did do a house check, a wellness check. Trouble is he was sleeping and they didn't bother to look any closer that he had really been beat up quite badly. And in three days, he was dead. So you get that kind of what keeps me up at night is knowing that these kids didn't need to die. These kids could have been saved if the decisions had been, had been different. So then you pick out another one. Uh, you go to little uh, Kendall Chick in 2017, four months old. And that's a case where she was taken from her mother because her mother was, had some severe drug issues. So they put her with the grandfather, a kinship. The trouble is with the departments, and they've all done this, when they put somebody in kinship, a, a child in kinship, then they end up, I'll say, oh, that's okay. The grandparents have it. Nothing to worry about here. We're going to move on. Well, that's not the way it should be. I go to these trials, these homicide trials for these kids. I haven't been as many as you have, Christine. I wanted to say that. But I've, I've been to a lot of them. Uh, and I'll tell you that he heard the grandfather, actually, it's his girlfriend that killed Kendall Chick. Uh, he, she beat her and pummeled her. And she got her in, uh, in February. And Kendall finally died in December. But there wasn't any visits from the department from that time, from February to December. And, uh, and in the trial, they, they agreed that had there been one check, if anybody had gone through that door and looked at that child, they would have seen the kind of abuse that she was getting. And that's what, again, that's what keeps me awake at night when I know, we all know that these things could have been prevented. So Kendall, I mean, the grandfather testified in court that he also was a drug, had serious drug issues. In fact, before he went to work at Bath Iron Works every day, he had to get drugged up. And Shauna Gatto, the, the woman that actually did the, got convicted of depraved indifference murder, she, and she was the one that uh, was doing all the, having all the abuse issues. At one point, she even took Kendall's head and smashed it into the wall, left an indent into the, into the drywall with her hair follicles in it so they know where it came from. So they all had, they just had to have seen her once and they would have, they would have dealt with that. Then you had right off, that was in December and then February, Marissa Kennedy, 10 year old in Stockton Springs, was continually beaten by her stepfather, Julio Carrillo, and her mother, Sharon Carrillo, uh, on a regular basis. And here's what, here's the terrible story here I've talked to the school reported this to the department. I talked to the principal just as recently as uh, like two or three weeks ago, but I talked to him a lot right after that, that trial. And they were frustrated because they would report, report, report. The neighbors, they lived in a condo situation. The neighbors reported to the police. The police reported to the department. All these reports. And finally, they had, they had a, this woman testified. She was a caseworker. She testified uh, at the hearing that she went in. She... She actually saw, sat in the home with, with Julio and with all three of them, and Sharon and with Marissa. But she said, Julio, this is a quote, was so charming, I could not imagine he had done anything. So I didn't worry. So that's, and he, I guess he was, but he, he wasn't in real life. So what he brought, what he did to her, he used to make her, they used to both make her get on her knees on a tile floor, hold her hands above her head, and they would beat her with a mop handle. And then they would put her in this dark, dark closet for a couple hours, and that's where she would stay. Well, she was beaten so much so often that when that caseworker came to the home finally, uh, she passed out. And uh, Julio said to the caseworker, explained that, well, she's just been, she's, uh, she's been tired, she hasn't been sleeping well. It wasn't just falling asleep, she actually passed out. So those, again, when, when you have that kind of a system that doesn't follow through, that kind of a system where decisions are, are made in, inappropriately, then that really, that really uh, is something that we've got to change. And the only way to change this is shine a big light on the department, which is what we've been doing. The last one, the most, probably the most infamous one, is Maddox Williams. He's three years old. 
he was also in that and lived in that area and he was the one where uh, his mother was a convicted felon she had 11 convictions uh, one of them was a gun robbery she dealt drugs she did all these things she abandoned him for 23 of his first 23 months of his first two years and then she wanted him back she they had taken him away they wanted him she didn't do any contact with him at all so it was an abandonment by law so what happened was she then decided she wanted him back and everybody's told the department and and the courts please don't do this she's not she's she's um, her grandmother victoria vos the grandmother of maddox calls her a monster because the family everybody knew that that's the way she was she was into the drug issues really really hard so what happened at the end they let him go back to her above all the screams and yells and the pleads and all of that. So he went back home with uh, Jessica Trefethen. That was his biological mother. And in three months, he was dead. He was literally beat to death. He, finally, what, what he really was done is he was stomped to death. She weighed 200 pounds, and he weighed 27. And she stomped him. She ruptured his bowels, broke his, uh, fractured his spine, uh, severed his pancreas, and he had brain bleeds. He had bruises all over him. The bruises on his face throughout the time he was there, she would put children's tattoos on his face. So finally, they got someone to come and do a well, wellness check. She wouldn't let the people into the, in all fairness, many times she wouldn't let people into the department. She would, uh, into their apartment, into their, their, actually it was a trailer. So as a result of that, um, he wasn't seen as much as he should have. There should have been an aggressive move by the department to go in and with her history to do that. So eventually, finally, she let them in, but it was a time, again, when he was sleeping. He was in a darkened room. He had, he had blankets over him. So they went in, looked at him, said, everything's fine. And he, would, he died. He was dead shortly thereafter to the, being pummeled by her. She was convicted of depraved indifference murder. So... When you see all these things happen, <clears throat> and we learn about these, um, our commitment has been, you've got to change the way you're doing things, OCFS and the department. You've got to stop doing what you're doing and change. So we, a year ago, this past March, the three of us went on the road, Melanie, Patrick, and myself, and we started traveling all over the state, and we talked to hundreds of people, and we asked them, people who deal with the department, two questions. What's the problem from your perspective? And if you're a caseworker, a foster parent, or whether you're law enforcement or daycare, whatever you are, what do you, what's the problem with HHS? And they would tell us, and then we would say, what's the answer? What's your solution? How can we prevent this? And they, would never, they had never been asked. Uh, and they wouldn't have said anything anyway because the fear of retaliation, which is, again, is part of the management technique style that's used too often in the department. So... That's, what it, that's how it ended up with our involvement. We did from March to the following, what was it, September? I think it was 10 months, anyway, maybe, maybe in October. Whatever it was, it was like 10 months out there on the road gathering this information. And then we, then we published it in this thing that which, uh, Patrick came up with the name. It's called Unsupported because that's just what it is. Everybody who deals with the department, one of the things, they told us two things. One, they weren't supported, especially the caseworkers who... Who, uh, who work, you know, work day, day by day. And then the foster parents, Melanie will tell you, the foster parents just are out there almost on their own sometimes. So we really felt compelled to find some real answers, do some real grassroots research, and then share it. In, in December of last, this past year, we did a press conference at, at the State House Hall of Flags, and we released all of this information. Um, that was, I think that was, it inspired the committee that's been investigating the department. On June 30th, 2021, I sent a letter to the Government Oversight Committee, the Watchdog Committee, and I asked them to investigate HHS, specifically the Office of Child Family Services, which they, that was in June, and they voted, voted to do that in August. So that's when the investigation started in 21. In, in 2021, we had 34 kids die. 34. And in 22 and 23, 54 more. So you don't hear about these, and there's a lot of reasons for that. A lot of those, a lot of those are not murders, but they're deaths that the department should have been more aware of the environment. We have a child welfare ombudsman in the state of Maine, and she's an independent agency. And what she, is, what she has said for four years in a row in her reports, four years in a row, that the department struggles with making decisions, safe decisions for kids. 
for the kids that they have, that they have, uh, they're in charge of. So that hasn't gotten any better. Uh, and when you get these number of children who are dying, uh, that's, those are, that raises a lot of red flags, or it should for all of us. So that made us even more determined to shine this light on a situation that is, that is got to be, got to be fixed. Um, the Government Oversight Committee released their report yesterday uh, on their investigations, and amazingly, have you seen it yet, Mel? Amazingly, their report has many of the recommendations we have in here, which we think is wonderful. Uh, nobody owns this stuff. They move up. We wanted this to become public, and we did it at a time when they were, st they were still doing their investigation. So for us, we think that's, that's fantastic. Uh, there's no ownership on this stuff. So the more people that know, the better. And then, of course, we had um, one of the things we learned is that the director of OCFS, uh, there's a lot of issues uh, relating to his management style. Uh, and then a week before we, this came out, he resigned. Uh, as director, um, and he just said, he just resigned and, and went on his way. So they then, they being the department, had a chance to replace him, and we were all hoping that they would choose somebody from away, not connected with the, with the system. They selected a person who's a very nice person. If you met her, you'd really like her a lot. Problem is, she's been in that same department for 28 years, and she was the assistant to the director that had to resign, resign quickly. So we'll see what happens with, with all of that. But the, the calls that I get every day and the people who call and connect with our, you know, our website, they still are having the same problems. For example, this, the school people are still telling us, school administration, they make a child will self-report to, to a school counselor, administrator, or a teacher. The mandated report is they have to report. They call the department, and the ones that are talking to us, they don't get a response. You don't get a response in, a, in an appropriate time frame, or maybe not at all. So we had, in fact, when we had our rally last week, the superintendent of the schools from Callis came down, um, and she, uh, Superintendent Spearin, and she gave examples in, during, our, during our press, the presser with the, with the, with, at the State House, and she said, you know, we make these calls, and, and they're so closed, the curtain is so tight, we can't get through to them. And it's very frustrating if you're a mandated reporter for that not to happen, for not feel like you can protect these kids. Charles says, I have an unsafe home. What do you do? You send them home right back into that situation because no one's gotten back to you as a mandated reporter. So all of these, these resignations, the commissioner just issued this past week, she's going to resign, <clears throat> excuse me, effective uh, May 31st. Isn't that right, Patrick? Um, <clears throat> so I think that, um, I think, that indicates that there is, I mean, there's some potential for change. But when you get people at this level who are deciding to move on, um, to me, that's a good sign because they probably felt like they should. And I think that we have, to, we have to look at that in a positive way. It's another opportunity to bring somebody else in and, and do some things. The problem with somebody coming in now, this administration ends in two years. So... There's no, maybe they not want to, they won't want to give that kind of time or effort. I'm not sure, but we really can't wait two more years for another whole new administration to come in. And so we're going to be at. We're not going to let up. I mean, we're going to be we're going to be keeping going. We're going to be maybe even more intense than we have been. Um, so I, I I feel really positive. I think we feel really positive. We have a good a lot of volunteers. Most of us are volunteers. We have a couple of 1099s to do some technical things and gather research for us. But we really feel like um, <clears throat> we're about, we've, we've become so well known, people are calling us more and more and more, but we get, we're still volunteers with not a lot of, necessarily a lot of time. We have, I have a business to run and other things, and these people do too. So <clears throat> um, what I'm going to do is going to show you a, a short video to give you a feel. You're going to see Victoria Vos. She's the grandmother of Maddox Williams, a little three-year-old that was, that was murdered by his bio mother. <clears throat> You're going to hear from Melanie in that, in that video and others. So take a look at this. I think it'll give you a real feel of, of what we do and why, or mostly why we're doing what we do. So you're going to see, watch me. You can be proud of me. I 
punya semua orang. <laughs> I don't know if I can tell this story. <laughs> Needs are not being met, and there's a failure to protect our children. That did not need to happen. If they had done any wellness report that could see his body, he would be alive today going to kindergarten in September. DHH just failed my grandson Maddox and continues to fail children. Maddox was a sweet little boy. He was small for his age, blonde, blue eyes, and very witty and, and very funny. Where's Daddy? Uh. Where'd Daddy go? Maddox was born 2018, he was early. DHHS opened a case against Jessica because her young child overdosed on methadone. We ended up going to Belfast to pick him up that evening. January 2020, my son was arrested and he, I ended up taking guardianship of him. I said to the DHHS worker, is there any way that Maddox will go back to his mother? And they said, no, if that was going to happen, we wouldn't be here. I was totally blindsided um, when the judge in DHHS gave him over to her. She was a complete stranger to him. He, he didn't know who she was. I mean, I would ask them to go check on him, and she would not allow them in. He had bruises, but she would always say it was from an older sibling, you know, throwing a toy or him falling because he was clumsy. Maddox was not clumsy. It was on June 21st, early in the morning, when I found out Maddox had died. We've got kids like Maddox Williams who, who are being placed by the department into a home with the biological mother when she's a convicted felon, when she had 11 other convictions, where she's been abusing drugs, where she refuses to cooperate with the department, and yet they put that little boy back in that house. And he only lasted three months because she beat him to death. She stomped him. She weighed 200 pounds. He weighed 27. My name is Melanie Blair. I'm a foster parent. Uh, I have been for about eight years. We had a placement. Um, this child came to us at about eight years old, taken from the mother. Uh, didn't have any contact with the father. Had a There was a DV, domestic violence history with dad. I think we had maybe four months the first time. She was in a special behavior program. Uh, a little wild and kind of off the wall, but very well otherwise. By the end of the school year, she was doing really well. It was kind of a game changer moment at the last minute. Dad wanted to take custody and they didn't have any reason not to. Even though he had domestic violence, that was not perpetrated on the child, so that's where she went. And two years later, we got her back and she was so She wasn't the same kid when she came back. Um, her face was all bruised. She was really, really thin. Um, and she had some medical condition because she had been hit so hard that she couldn't talk right. Her, her mouth drooped and she just, she didn't sound like a regular kid. number one worst 
state in America for child mill treatment. It's anguishing. There's a federal guideline that said states should be reuniting children with their, with their parents at a minimum of 40%. The purpose should be to find a safe placement for children. There shouldn't be any kind of ideology that enters into this. It should be strictly what is the safe place for the child. The system is broken, but it's the way that it's broken. It's not a clean break that you can look at the obvious problem and fix it. It's fragmented, and that's why the children are falling through the cracks, because it's fragmented. The department polices itself and preserves itself, which is a breeding ground for corruption. The department is not listening to caseworkers and is not listening to mandated reporters. Enough is enough. We need to tell the truth. We need to say that the management is broken and we need to, we need to fix it. I would love to see foster parents and caseworkers and everybody working together and all having a seat at the table at the same time and really making a difference for these kids. <clears throat> so um, that gives you a feel, I hope, of what we do and why we do it. And those are two examples uh, how this, this whole thing keeps coming up. It's not just Maddox every time, but it's, but it's too similar uh, for us to ignore. So, so now I'm going to introduce again um, Melanie Blair. Uh, Melanie is, as I said, a foster parent. You saw her in this, in this film here, in this video. And she has been uh, a real soldier. Um, she has a whole thing, a lot of things going on at home with the number of children she's respons responsible for, she and Gary. But uh, she's taken so much time and worked with us, and she is us. So, Melanie, it's yours. Am I on? Okay. Um, thank you. I always have a hard time watching myself tell that story um, because that kiddo that I was talking about was elementary school age uh, when we had her the first time, um, a tweener um, when we got her the second time, and she's still in care, and she's 15. Um, she's been in 27 different homes, residential treatment, and just can't settle anywhere. Um, and I truly believe that didn't need to happen and wouldn't have happened if she would have stayed the first time. Um, we, we had no say over their decision and she went home. Um, not to mom, but to a lot of unknowns and what happened the second time was way worse than the first. So uh, that keeps me going because I think about her all the time and wish that her end story would have been different. Um, we've now been fostering for just a little over nine years. Um, we, we have been targeted when we speak out um, early on. We've, we had some retaliation that we had to fight through, um, and that was something that we didn't expect to happen. We were working with the Department of Health and Human Services. We thought this was going to be a relational thing, that we were equal seats at the table. Um, that was not what we experienced in the beginning. Uh, we kind of had to fight our way up, uh, which, which we did. We are passionate about what we do, so, you know, from time to time we take a break and we get right back to it. We do it for the kids, not for the adults that are in charge um, in central office. So that's kind of a little bit of my background. Um, we, we have six kids now at home. We have adopted. Um, my two youngest are five and 10. 
they, they were adopted out of foster care. All of my husband and I's children um, are grown and flown and come back for college vacation or college break. Um, but we, we most literally did start over when we got into foster care and we did not intend to adopt. That wasn't our, we weren't looking to do that. We were helping to help, hoping to help people, you know, rise up from where they were and support the family the best we can. Um, and these two kids that we, we have adopted um, couldn't go home. And there's been, you know, a lot of cases that have been good success stories, but there's been a lot that have not. Um, in the last two years, we've had cases, a lot of kids that uh, have come to us with uh, parents that have struggled with substance abuse and domestic violence. Um, and right now the trend seems to be that mom is so unstable that the, the kids are spending more time going back to the abuser of mom, um, which is hard. So trending wise, it, it goes in different directions during different time periods. Uh, what really gets me is the lack of um, ability for the department to really admit that there's a problem. When I first started speaking out a couple of years ago, uh, about a year before Bill and I crossed paths, I was advocating um, in a small foster group, a uh, social networking way where I have a lot of, I connect with a lot of parents, foster parents across the states uh, in different counties and we just network um, because nobody really understands what we're going through unless you're a foster parent, you just don't. Um, you talk to your family members and such, and they say, well, why are you continuing to do this? You know, just stop. Um, so we have, I had a network of people that related to what, you know, what the struggles were. And the more people I talked to, the more I learned when we traveled um, for 10 months, it was one heartbreaking story after another. Uh, of total dysfunction, like n none of this needed to happen. Um, I, uh, I have a foster mom friend that lives up um, north. It's about as much as I'll say, and she's, she has struggled. She had a placement that went home and, and then died. Um, she's had placements that went home that, and then that she got back and um, suffered way more abuse. So she's, she's really seen a lot and she's terrified to talk to people um, because she's still licensed and she's not the only one. So that's one of the things that we found as we traveled across the state as, you know, I, I wish that my bad experiences were mine and only mine and this wasn't um, happening all over the place, but it is. And the more that people reach out and get involved, the more light is shined on, on what's going on and, and they can't ignore it anymore. Um, when I've, yes. So um, Christine asked if foster parents, because ultimately the judge makes the decision um, whether or not the child go ho goes home or goes to whatever placement. And uh, if we have a role in, our, and are able to speak to the judge, that's correct, right? Okay. So, I would love to speak to the judge personally, um, but one, so I will say that we are technically on paper entitled to receive every notice of every court date that has to do with a child that's in our care. Um, that's part of the Foster Parent Bill of Rights. It's, it's written down, it doesn't happen. So if I get notice to attend, um, now they're not in person, so they're on Zoom, very often what happens is I log on to the meeting link and I sit in the waiting room and the little circle spins and spins until I'm allowed to come into the court proceeding. Now, sometimes I get let in, um, I'm not allowed to talk. See that nobody asks, you know, how, um, how do you think this case is going? So no, the judge does not hear from me. Um, the judge hears what the caseworker presents and foster parents hope and pray that that information is accurate. And I can tell you in some cases, because I have experienced this personally, that sometimes caseworkers are so 
bogged down that they either willingly or unwillingly complete documentation inaccurately because they have to put something in the computer. So whether it's intentional or not, um, not for me to judge, but that's what goes into the computer. That's what goes all the way up the chain. It gets signed off on, it goes to the AG, it gets presented to the judge. And I'm sitting there saying, me, me, ask me, please. Um, and I can't, I, I have no right to speak to the judge unless I'm spoken to. It's a major flaw and, and really something that I can tell you with 100% certainty, <laughs> every foster parent that, you know, would be asked would say the same thing. It is very rare that we get to have a voice unless we file some special um, paperwork and I can't think of what it's called right off the top of my head, but there's something we can file to have intervener status. That's what it is. Um, that's not looked very favorably upon if we do that. So most, we don't, most of us don't. Um, but thank you for the question. Um, is, things like that, there's so many of those little things that um, when we see these horrific stories of Maddox or um, Haley Godding, um, and, and that wasn't a murder, that was an overdose death, um, but it was because of neglect and all these other deaths that happen, these are after it's possible to do anything to change it. And that's where my problem is because we live with these kids every day. We see what's going on. We know things that the department doesn't know and they don't listen. Um, it is so frustrating because some of the repeated abuse and neglect does not need to happen. And maybe not every one of our kids that go home to an unsafe situation is gonna die and end up like Maddox, but it is just as bad to go home and have drip, drip, drip of abuse and neglect for the rest of your life. Um, just because a child isn't killed doesn't mean that they're any better off. Uh, and, and I know that sounds horrible, but these kids are suffering in silence and nobody is listening to them. Nobody listens to us. Um, and that's really what I hope to change. And sometimes I get discouraged because I don't play politics, um, but I would rather continue to be the squeaky wheel and shine hopefully the light onto somebody and eventually make change. And I, and I think, you know, seeing some of the things that have happened as of late, um, we are making some, some movement. Um, which is very encouraging. Um, anybody else have any questions? Good. Okay, so her question was, uh, what kind of things do would somebody fear regarding retaliation? Um, license is one. So I am licensed as a foster parent. That license is at the will and discretion of the department. If they want to revoke my license, they can do so at any time. Every two years, I have to relicense. Um, I did relicense in August. Um, and conveniently, at that same time, I had um, a couple of interesting things come up that I had to address with the department um, to, in order to keep going through the process. So these inconveniences don't seem like flat out retaliation, but you know, that's what they are. It, it, it's like a caseworker that all of a sudden is struggling and gets this huge um, investigation to go complete and they're already burnt out. Um, and that's a story that was actually shared with us personally um, from a caseworker. Um, so that can happen. Uh, we can have false accusations and investigations that have to be investigated by the department. When we go to training, they do say, expect investigations, it's par for the course, it happens. Um, so we all get that, and, but it's not, what you go through as a family is not, um, you can't brush that off, it, it's traumatizing for your entire family. And uh, the process is, you know, is awful. I don't, I don't have any other words besides that. Um, 
aside from that, for somebody like me, I'm also an educator. So not only do I get licensed by the state to do foster care, but I also have to relicense to be an educator. Um, so that fear is always in the back of my mind. Now, when you're talking about investigations, if you have a, a foster, as a foster family, if you have an investigation, um, now you have to report that to your employer. If, so for me, as an educator, that's, it's a double-edged sword. So I'm walking a very fine line every day with what I say, uh, because I, I know that, you know, you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you, right? <laughs> um, but I also care so much about these kids that I'm willing to kind of take that step. So yes, that, that's absolutely real for foster parents. Um, and the other thing that they do is they move kids. So if you're not cooperating with um, the department on whatever level they are asking you to do things, um, it's, well, you're not cooperating with the plan, so we're gonna move the child. Now, if you have become attached to that child, that's, in a, aside from your own personal feelings, you know, as a family, as a kid in care, just to be used as leverage to move, I mean, that's sick. I, I don't care who you are. Um, to move a child just because the, the foster parent isn't like transporting to every visit because they have a job or they've rocked the boat too many times and now they say, um, well, we, we feel like that child would be doing better somewhere else. Every one of us that does this knows what attachment disorders are because these kids all have attachment issues at one level or another um, because they've been ripped from their parents' homes, even if they have been for a legitimate reason, they still have this trauma. Uh, and just to send them from place to place to place, uh, it's, it's hard and sometimes kids do need to move, but to be used as a leveraging tactic because you're not doing what you're supposed to do, that's, um, that's unacceptable, it really is. And, and when I tell you that this, the kid that I was talking about has been moved 27 times, I mean literally 27, uh, in addition to staying in a residential treatment program for a good amount of time. I mean, some of these kids will never attach to anybody ever again. Uh, and that's sad, as somebody who has healthy attachments to parents and family and my own kids, I, I can't imagine not having that. And I, it angers me to the core to know that the department failed her the first time. She didn't need to experience that. Yeah. Um, so, if, are you, is there a link to the board? Is there some sort of like third party accountability that has an insight and influence over how the foster families are treated and most importantly, the foster children? That is definitely something we have been talking to, uh, talking about as a group. And there, ha there were a couple of bills that came up last session that didn't get through that probably would have done that, but that's, that, that is on the radar for sure. I'm just thinking like a community of these families and doing this work, we can speak to the HS in, in a non-confrontational way of just the facts. So this is what we've experienced in the Most of you work for you, this is what these children have experienced. And that should matter to them. It should, yeah. There's few people that they let into their bubble, and I think that legislatively it was initiated to have a foster parent bill of resolves, which did pass last year. Um, I, I participated in that with a group of about, depending on the day, we only had probably three or four sessions that we met together via Zoom. Um, some days there were six of us, some days there was 20. Um, so that did happen. Uh, we did do that with the department, and we had input. Um, I, nothing on paper has come out yet to see exactly where that's going. It, it's being completed and printed, but the, like you said, the problem is, is that, and this was my point from the very first day, foster parents do, we have these rights, like the court hearing right um, that we spoke about, um, but when it comes to oversight, who do we complain to? Nobody. We complain to the person that's doing it, which is not effective. Yes. And I'm supposing that 
But that's what the recommendation is. I downloaded it right while I was sitting here, the unsupported document, but that's one of the recommendations that's in there. Um, so for, for people's consideration, that's what we'd like to have. Yep. Um, and I think that this took a long time and it's really well done and it is online and that that was something that we talked about in here very you know specifically um, I think the oversight committee recognizes that as well um, but these are all things that just got out so now it's like we've spent a lot of time doing this um, it has to go into the application stage of what it's going to actually look like when it unfolds but we're certainly not going to let it just go I'm probably jumping the gun on where you're going, but how do people like us, and you don't need to answer it yet if we're gonna talk about it more, but how do people like us help keep that moving forward so it doesn't just get lost, so it doesn't become static? You know, because we're, we're constituents, we're, we're people who support this and we have voices, and how do we actually do that? So I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna derail where you guys are going, because I really appreciate you answering these, these questions, so thank you. You want me to keep going, Bill? Emily, go first and then come up. Okay. I have a quick question yeah. though before you do um, wrap up. So on a lower level, like, you know, boots on the ground level, it sounds like you literally have to take the initiative to go build this support network between other foster moms or foster parents. Is there nothing above what you guys are doing for yourselves that is helping you in your journey to support these kids? Like, are you getting support at all? Or are the foster kids getting support at all? I get a lot of support now. <laughs> I couldn't have told you that two years ago, um, which is why I said squeaky wheel. Uh, there, so AFFM, which is a family for me, is a resource for foster families. I have used it. It has been a fantastic resource. Um, they can connect you with trying to find some materials. They can talk you through some, um, when we talked about allegations, support, they have somebody that can talk you through, well, this is what happened, this is the process of what's gonna happen. Um, so some of those things, they do have these meetings called CARES meetings where foster families can go and it's confidential and you can talk to each other and hope that nobody says anything, which they don't typically. Um, so there are some things. The problem with AFFM, as great as it is, they get their funding from the state, right? So, you know, like I said, you don't bite the hand that feeds you kind of thing. It's not, it's not independent, like the Ombudsman's Office. Uh, what I personally would like to see is something like the Ombudsman's Office for foster families. Um, but we have some resources, but we really, you know, you're as strong as the community of people you build around you. And if, if you have people that care and they can't foster, but they can help you, like uh, I could have used help on Friday when I was gonna go to the State House to watch the Government Oversight Committee deliver the, their thing, which I was going to. Um, but I had a kid that couldn't make it through daycare and I got called to pick up at nine o'clock, 45 minutes after I dropped him off. So, um, but I didn't have any help that day. So that, that's what I'm, there are some resources, but we really, you know, you can't sink or float if you don't have your team. Um, it's hard. Can you get people approved to help you with the children outside of like your family or, or do you have to like get that because it's people who know? Like are there any organizations that, uh, Sort of looking for like free trace type support. So respite, um, there there are respite providers that are licensed by the department. We do have to request those, and cross our fingers that we get them. So if it's an absolute, you I absolutely need this. Um, yes, I typically can get those providers from them. I can recruit my own, um, and ask them to go through the process. Some of, I have had one that's done that. Um, but generally speaking, what we can do, it, what they encourage us to do is prudent parenting. So we have friends that we think are safe with our own kids. Uh, we can recruit them to help us however we want. Um, and, but if something comes up with that, then it's, well, that's your fault because that's prudent parenting. And um, I've never had that problem. So, but I know others that have. Um, 
but it is, you know, it's very challenging to find resources out there. But I've gone on for a long time. I want Emily to come up, and then maybe we can go back to your question after. Thank you. I have to have my notes. <laughs> um, and I, I think, oh. I think I wanted to also address your question about retaliation um, because it's a very real thing. And I am a social worker in the field and have experience with the department. And um, the department has actually reached out to my employer um, in, in, in attempts to silence me since I have been a part of Walk a Mile. So this takes a lot of bravery, a lot of courage. I can't speak to who my employer is or to the horrific things that I know of that children experience on a daily basis. Um, but I can tell you people are keeping a close eye on me. Um, so today I think both Bill and Mal did such a good job sort of outlining the really sobering statistics of the children that have died and the failures of our system. So I'll speak a little bit to that in my experience, but also what can we sort of do as citizens to protect the kids that are right in front of us? So, I have been, sorry, I'm having a hard time keeping this. So I've been a social worker for over a decade here in Maine, and I've become involved with Walk a Mile because of the countless failures that I see my children go through on a daily basis. Through the many forms of abuse that I see children experience, sexual abuse is the most occurring and the least acknowledged. I'm focusing on sexual abuse today, given the conference here that we're at. I've worked with countless children with the exact same story. A child is brave enough to speak up to a trusted adult that someone is sexually abusing them. An adult thinks they're doing the right thing by contacting DHHS. But little do they know, DHHS is not equipped to handle this. They are not trained, and they do not have the skill set to gauge for safety, which leads them to making decisions that are based off subjective opinions and assumptions. The case then closes. The child returns to the abuser and any potential trust with an adult in sense of safety is completely shattered. The abuse continues and this time the child has learned to not speak up. This child is now subjected to a life of potential revictimization and even sex trafficking. Statistics show that 96% of sexual abuse reports are true. However, DHHS, our court systems, and even our society responds as if only 4% are telling the truth. We, we must flip the script, and we do this by listening, believing, and advocating for our children. I can share from experience that you only have one shot at this. One shot at believing and responding the way a child needs you to a way that ch a child feels heard and safe. Never under underestimate the power you give a child when you believe them. You may also notice children having difficulties with behaviors across all settings when abuse is occurring. This could be the child that cannot sit still, the one that talks too much, too little, or maybe the one in the corner with their hood on, completely withdrawn. I often hear them being referred to as disrespectful, manipulative, or defiant. I see it all too often. Children are pathologized and labeled the problem. Their behaviors are not a mystery to solve. Behavior is a child's way of communicating. Let's be the adults who listen. As the saying goes, if you see something, say something. If something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't. You never know what life you may be saving by genuinely caring about a child and asking the questions that may feel uncomfortable. As we know the statistics, one in five children are sexually abused. That is a underestimated number, which means you are very likely interacting with multiple children who are currently being abused. There are many important things that we can do as a community to help prevent child sexual abuse. We know the department cannot. Let's normalize dis discussing child sexual abuse and not, no more staying silent about it. Educating children as well as adults that the perpetrator is always almost, I'm sorry, almost always someone the child knows. T 
Teach children and inform yourself of the signs of grooming. Create trusting relationships and environments so children feel safe coming to you and sharing what's going on. Teach them body boundaries. Allow them to say no. And above all, please remember that perpetrators are not typically creepy looking. They are not the stereotypical image that's portrayed in the media and the movies. They are your well-liked citizens in our communities, which makes it all the more, di more difficult for children to come forward. This is one of the many reasons why 38% of child sexual abuse goes un unreported. Walk a mile in their shoes will continue to fight for system reform that protects children from every form of abuse. We will not stop until change happens. Please continue to stand alongside us and be the voice for thousands of abused children that are crying out for help and are not being heard. Change is not easy and it does take time, which is why it is so important for us to take action as citizens to keep our children safe. Thank you. If you'd like, we can, the three of us will go up here and answer any questions you might have. If, if, if not, whatever you want to do. Okay. <clears throat> just want to respond to that, that question you had about what can you all do. What we all, what we found has been so, um, so successful for us is when we let people know. I mean, all the folks we speak to, it's when they become uh, in, kind of being sensed about what's happening and they speak out. They write letters to the editor or they may, <clears throat> they may do anything in their, in their local communities. But the fact that they're speaking out and saying is enough is enough, that is very, very powerful. So you talk to your neighbor, you're helping. If you write a letter to the editor, you're helping. If you any of those things you do, um, that really does make a difference. It really does work. And the department ends up hearing it. Legislators hear it. The press hears it, which is even better. Uh, we've gotten more press in the last probably three months than we have all the time before what we've done, only because our awareness is greater. So anyway, any questions of any of us? Uh, we'd love to answer those for you. <clears throat> General, I think the kind of piggybacks on what Mark says is kind of what we'll walk away with. Is I guess the way I'm processing this is I read the last day, report, 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 report. Now you need a picture, but that's what we need to do. But when we do report, we're reporting these kids into chaos. So I guess trying to balance that and walk away. So maybe how, do, how does my brain wrap around that? Let's say we're not, not report, because that's what we need to do. But if we do report, what does that mean for, for these kids going into the system that could potentially massively fail? So it sounds like a no win situation, which part of this is. But I guess that's my thought. So I guess it's not really a question. I guess how would you respond to that? You want to hear it from the foster parent side? Or? So I'm going to answer that as a foster parent and as an educator um, who has made waves. I will make a report and I will follow up on the report and I will keep following up on the report and they're t until they're tired of hearing from me or until I see that something has happened. Um, and that's why I stay doing what I'm doing is because I haven't seen the results that I think should, have, should happen yet. Um, if you're in a situation where you've seen something that maybe doesn't appear to be sexual abuse and is something like... Um, um, this is the example that I'm going to come out with because I experienced it when I was working in one school system. Um, a, a little girl told me she was living in a car with her dad. It was winter. I know that if I report that, which I'm going to because I'm mandated, um, they're not going to do anything because they're in a car. It's not, that's not enough. That's not the threshold where they're going to intervene. Um, I can offer as an educator blankets. I can offer resources as far as um, where you can go for shelter. Um, I can try to help that family in some level, but when you're talking about major abuse or sexual abuse or you know serious abuse and you have to report and you can't try to help that family, um, then you need to make that report and then you need to follow up on the report in two days or in a week um, until they get tired of hearing from you or you reach out to your legislator and say, hey, I made a report and I don't know who to follow up. If you go on the OCFS website, it is convoluted to get through, but 
they do have some chains of, you know, hierarchy, but, you know, it, like we've said, they don't listen. Um, educators have the same problem, but that doesn't stop me from trying because <laughs> I, I can't stop anything that I don't report. Uh, it, my, I coach basketball for rec, and I often use illustrations from that, but I have had kids that won't shoot the ball, and I said, you will never score a point if you don't take a shot. And you might fail 15 shots out of 16, but it, you know that last one that you made, you, you, you put it up. You, know, you don't know what call is gonna tip them off. So I would say keep calling. Like just to piggyback on that really quick and just say one thing that you can do, even in those situations that I've learned, is document, 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 write every Absolutely. single call, every single call, every single email, every single conversation, <laughs> write it down. Because when you get the opportunity to present it to the legislative committee or to change a law or to be invited into a space, then you have documentation that can't be disputed. Like, you have documentation that says, I text here, I called here, I showed up here, I text again. This is why we're here, because none of these things made anything happen. None of these things changed anything. And that's why we're here at this meeting. They can't dispute those things. If you have proof, if you have documentation, what are they going to say? You're lying, you didn't call? Well, actually, I have a screenshot of my phone. Right. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. persistency. <laughs> I think too, from you know a, the social worker standpoint and a relational standpoint, sort of like the department irrelevant. Thinking about the child and the relationship you have with them, because typically the department will do nothing, and oftentimes you will lose the child, whether it's in services or they might not come to you anymore because the parent is so angry at that child or at you. So typically, if you need to make a report, trying to navigate, navigate that the best way you can with the family. We really are worried about you. We kind of have to do this, so we're going to do it. Anything to keep that relationship, because oftentimes, so often, a report is made, and not only is that child in graver danger, now the ties to you are cut as well. And don't forget to take advantage of your church, because that's a built-in system right there. And... And if, if a church speaks out, if all of you speak out together, or even some of you, but talk, it, talk together about what your concerns are. If you call your legislator, by the way, this is a great time to do that between now and November because this is an election year. But what happens is oftentimes they, you might, they might just kind of deflect you off. Well, I'll look at it. I won't do what you say. If you're going to call a legislator, follow up every two days. What did you do? We, we have to have this looked at. This is my concern. Then I expect you to follow through with it. Don't be afraid to be very, very persistent. Got a question, but is there a better place to call? Or is there a place you shouldn't? Because <laughs> as I think through reporting something like this, you would know better than I do about, is it more effective to call the police? Is it more effective to call? Any, any advice? I'd call as many as you can. I'd make sure the department's part of it. But I'd call a local police if that's something that would be in their realm. Uh, I would call anybody and everybody because then you're becoming known and document it. So you, you go back and look at it again. Say, this is, this is the date I did this, this, and this. So it's important, I think, that take advantage of anybody. You can't talk to enough people because the more people know about it, the more, more impact you're going to have. I always feel like your point, Emily, kind of reinforces, I don't want this to come off wrong, but reinforces the fear of reporting, like exactly that, how to then be removed from the support of the people who care enough to say something like, what a conundrum. You report it, nothing happens, then the child no longer has your support. So like, if you're not a mandated reporter, if you're not in a role where you're mandated, like, how do you sit with knowing like what the right thing to do is yeah that's a really it's hard and it's it's situational um so i think you're you're sort of looking at who does this child have for supports now who could i reach out to to collaborate this bounce ideas around on how to proceed um but but you're right i think 
I think probably if I wasn't a mandated reporter, I wouldn't report as much as I do. Uh, because that's a really real reaction, is that kids don't get what they need, and, and the abuse tends to continue or worsen after a report's made. <clears throat> so I would urge you maybe reach out to, to that child's teacher maybe, or whoever's in their life that feels like a strong support system and just talk it through, because they're really hard decisions. So as a non-mandated reporter, you have a little bit more of a benefit that the, the rest of us do because Emily and I are mandated reporters. Um, you can remain anonymous when you call and that gives you a little bit of a cover because they cannot in any way, legally they're not supposed to, uh, disclose where that may have came, come from. Um, so you have less risk if that it makes it feel any better um, to make a report. Because yes, when it comes from us, chances are they're gonna know. Um, but like Emily said, from an educational setting, if I made a report, then I went to the school principal, I went to the school counselor, I went to the teacher. So all of these people that I know interact with that child know that I have a concern. Now, I may not go into details. I may just say, I'm worried about this kid. I'm making a report. I just want you to know um, if for some reason my connection with this child breaks, then can you please just keep an eye on them? Um, chances are you can find somebody. If you're talking about a, um, a church family, I have a wonderful church I attend in, in Auburn, and they have been so supportive. They have groups just for these things. Um, they have an adoption group. They have a foster families group. I can't even tell you how helpful this has been for me to, you know, people of faith bridge together and they really care and support each other. Um, I went through an experience <laughs> at my church a number of years ago with somebody that was a, um, a figure of influence in the church that was abusing other children and it was not known. Um, there were a, a number of us, a small handful that f had s suspicion. We went to our leadership. There's always somebody that is in your circle that you should be able to go to, and we did, and they were all over it, and, and it did get resolved. But keeping quiet is, is the, you know, it, it's scary sometimes to take that leap, but if sometimes you can do it without, you know, in an anonymous way, sometimes you can't. Um, I would encourage you to do what piece you feel safe doing. But. Every stop we, <clears throat> excuse me, every stop we made in that 10 months, the issue of retaliation, the fear of retaliation came up every single stop. These two ladies here have been threatened. Um, these, when, one night when Melanie spoke out, it was the next day that she, all of a sudden she had an investigation. Um, and I know that M's had a, Emily's had some some, you know, some threats in terms of at least, maybe not even covered threats, but they were threats, I guess, about her, about her job. So we have to remember we're dealing and confronting and questioning the largest and most influential state agency in, in state government because they have all these networks out there that they're paying contracts here, there, wherever, and they all have, those people all have a, have a concern about will they still get their contract money and everything else that goes with it. So it's, it's very powerful, very powerful. But the good news is the more these people speak out right here is the less apt they would be retaliated against because they're almost insulated. Anything happens to these two, we're going to go crazy about it and everybody's going to know about it and we're going to, we're going to be making sure that uh, they realize that, that that's not going to be accepted. But someone who speaks out once or twice, then that retaliation can be quiet and quick. Uh, join us and speak out as much as you can. <laughs> I don't want to be flip on that. I mean, it's, it's, it's serious. It's, it's not easy, but the more vocal you are, and if you, especially if you have a, a, you know, two or three or a group, then, then they're not going to do anything. And they may want to. Um, they asked, the new director asked to meet with us. We asked to meet with them, the old director, way back when we started. Then they, the new director asked to meet with us, which is what, three weeks ago or something like that, I think. Anyway, yeah, so we, we said, oh great, we're gonna get some discussion going, dialogue, maybe we can work together. 
We got together and come to find out the reason they wanted to meet with us is to, is to say to us, stop saying our system is broken. Uh, stop saying that we're, you know, that we're, doing, we're not doing a good job. And I, and I said to her, I said, it's not coming from us, it's your own employees. You have to go look in the mirror here because we got all this information from people who work with you. So I think that, um, I think now there are so many people too to add to that, like the government oversight committee and the press and the public. And there's so many people that know what's going on. To retaliate now would not be as easy for them as it has in the past. And that's because we're shining the light. And um, you're absolutely right. It should, you should not feel isolated on, on an island because you haven't been speaking out. And um, I know a lot of foster parents that, that still feel that way. And it's not fair that, um, you know, why do I have any more luck than anybody else? Um, because unfortunately, and, and I'm gonna use a quote that we, we were given from somebody who works um, in the department, not OCFS specifically, and, and I won't say any more than that, but he said that this is not a, a culture, there's not a culture of excellence here. It's a culture of intimidation. And that's how I feel as a foster parent, and that's what he said when he met with us. Um, and that's pretty powerful. I mean, this is a guy that works in the department, <clears throat> it, you know, in some realm. Um, we cannot change that culture of intimidation by being intimidated. And we can't stop being in intimidated if we don't speak up. Um, I chose to stop being a carpet and letting them wipe their feet on me. And the only reason, the only way I could do that was by doing this. So the more people do speak up, uh, the less they are going to be able to do that. And that's how we'll break the culture. And when they're coming after your job, or watching you for your job, that takes a lot of courage on both of these, these ladies' part. But that's really, that's real. So, and by the way, I think if, if, if you speak up and somebody, you're in a position where you can be retaliated against, let us know. Because we'll speak up. There's nobody here. Well, you know, I shouldn't say that. They're not going to bother me any because I'm not in a position that I depend on them or even... I'm not, they're not an issue as far as the, any kind of retaliation at all. So. Um, I'm curious if in your work um, and research, are you finding that there's you know, a large amount of time and energy and resources being spent like in the wrong areas or the wrong cases or targeting families who aren't the problem? Because sadly, I hear those stories sometimes and I get really frustrated. I'm like, you know, CPS getting called on a mom for something that seems pretty darn silly and completely obliviously uh, not a concern where we have children who actually have real problems. Like, do you guys run into that a lot? So I'm, I'm going to say yes. I, I do it. I have seen that. I have. We've talked to a lot of parents that have also reached out. Um, it and as foster parents, or a, as a foster parent and several others that I know of that have had investigations, the department is going to spend six to however many weeks. Uh, one foster mom was investigated for nine months. So if you think about all the time, money, and resources that go into checking into that some kind of complaint, which is probably silly. Um, how many other complaints are out there that are being ignored that are really are serious issues? So yes, I absolutely see wasted money out there and wasted resources. Um, as a foster parent with cases, what I see probably the most wasteful is in drug testing. Almost every case has issues with drugs. Um, you have a parent refusing to test, that's their right. They refused over and over and over again, but we keep spending money and belaboring a case for three years that's not going anywhere. Um, and the parent's refusing to test while you have a kid that needs some real significant um, solutions to some mental health problems that they have. But we're spending the money and attention on this. So it goes both ways, um, for sure. But Emily, what do you see? I agree with that. I, I like to think of it as just a giant pendulum. 
Um, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason sometimes. And I think what it boils down to is just the lack of training and the resources. Um, when you think of the department in an investigation, it's, it's one person. It's one caseworker who typically is probably in their 20s, has no life experience, no experience in the field, and they're carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. And they're overworked and they have no support doing this. So they are expected to make these life-changing decisions by themselves, and there's no way any one person can do that. There's a couple of things I wanted to say. One, and I, and I think that Christine can touch base on this. So Victor, um, who we heard over the last couple of days, he's worked with um, universities who have uh, a social worker program. And they take what was sorority houses that maybe were abandoned for whatever reason, and then they create that, um, that sorority house as an experiential training facility for social workers who don't have the experience. They might engage real life cases, like maybe a toddler that was found in a trash ridden, junky sort of thing with the baby found eating the trash off the ground or whatever. They set it up to look like real life cases, recreate that, and give those social workers what would be real life experience. So we don't lose the social workers as soon as they go in, they see reality, and then you know they're out of there. And we're talking about here what we don't want, right? And glimpses of what we do want. And one of the things that I want to focus on is how can we help get what they want? So Bill was saying, well, they only have two years of this before we get the, the next group. So who has a good system in place? Where in the United States are they doing this really well? And are they willing to guide us and tell us what, what programs they have? And Victor and Pete Singer, who Victor had talked about, are experts nationally. So I've offered to do a Zoom with their team and Pete, I talked to Pete yesterday, and Victor, to try to collaborate to see what we can learn from other states that we can support them in creating that here in this state. And I'll certainly pass along whatever to you guys so we can learn how we can support this. <clears throat> Thank you, Catherine. We don't want to, I think we've taken more time than we probably one more question. Yeah, go ahead. So, what would be your top three lists? I know it took me two seconds to find the report online, so anybody can find it. Uh, just a little reminder. Uh, that has a lot of recommendations, but as taxpayer, as a person, as somebody who cares about this, what are the three things that maybe we would sit there and go, this is what I want to see, or these would be the first three steps that would make the biggest difference? Is there any, anything like a list like that? I know there are a number of recommendations. I guess I'm trying to pare it down to make it easier for me to communicate with other people. If we don't get transparency in that department, nothing's going to change. We have to have transparency. We have to have people there who are willing to open up and admit, some, one of you said, admit you have a problem because they don't really want to do that. But until that, that culture changes back to where it should be, then we're, we're, we're going to still make some, we'll get some hits, but we're not going to get any home runs probably. But we need that management need to change. And that means they all have to be on board, including the governor. The governor needs to be speaking out. Um, and that hasn't happened yet. So we really, we really need to have, and, and we're, we're, the reason we're working so hard is because we know that we're getting through that iron curtain because we've seen the resignations of people decide they're going to go. So that's the key. The key is, and by the way, we've made a point not to say, you, Director Landry, you should go. We've never said that. And we haven't said to the, commi the commissioner, you, Commissioner Lembro, you need to go. But we've pointed out a problem or problems that obviously it's their responsibility. <clears throat> so until we get that transparency, and if we get to break down the, the curtain one piece at a time, which is what we're doing, until that really is transparent, then nothing's... We're not going to make any big hits, big, big advantages. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yes. 
So you asked for three things, and I'm a three-word kind of person, so I'm just thinking of something real quick off the top of my head as Bill was speaking. Um, transparency, how do we get transparency? You bring the issue to light by speaking. How do you do that as a person? You speak to people in your area. If we have people in every area of the state that, that network together and have their own little group um, that, that can share with us, then we can start keep compiling data. So transparency, how do you get that? You speak out and you group together in your area. Um, I lost it. It was there. <laughs> Communication, there it is. Communication was one of the biggest things that we heard as we traveled the state. We don't get calls back. Um, nobody's working together. We're all just on an island. We need to communicate with each other. Again, we don't get transparency by not communicating. We don't, if we don't communicate and speak out, then we're still stuck. Um, the culture changes that we need, so there's your third one. In order to get that, we need to still do all those things. Um, encouraging people to do what we're all doing. Um, so and that would be my take three. Um, it, it really is important just to form your own little groups where you're at. Uh, like at my church, we have, it's a little group, it, you know, but it's, it's big enough. Um, and, and they support each other and we outreach together. Um, I reached out to my, my state representative in my district. And by doing that, I had a nice conversation. He hooked me up with my state senator. Uh, we had a nice conversation and I've gone from there. So it, it just takes a kind of a concerted effort to f find the population of your like-minded people, I guess. And a church has a really good audience. I mean, you're all, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience, obviously, but um, my church has been very powerful and active and, you know, connected, so. That's my take three. Did you have any three? <laughs> no. take, one. take one. Mine, um, social worker here, the relationship. Um, never underestimate the relationship you have with the youth in front of you. Um, every child just needs one adult that cares about them. And regardless of the abuse they're going through, the abuse they've been through, what the department does or chooses to not do, telling their story and having you listen and believe them is planting seeds that are just monumental. I can't tell you the amount of teens that have sat in front of me that would just say, wow, nobody's ever asked me that. Nobody's ever cared to ask me what I've been through. So you have a lot of power in that. Thank you very much for having us. This has been uh, wonderful for us. We appreciate it. Any comments you have, you want to get in touch with us on our website or call us up. We're easy to get to. And, um, and please, pass the word. Uh, that's where your power lies and your biggest help you can be is just reaching out and telling your neighbors, your family members, anybody you can tell that this is something that we're in, a, we're in now in motion. We've got some motion going and uh, some momentum and we're not going to stop. Thank you. Yeah.